Jen, go ahead and take it away. Great, thanks, Nick. Thanks, Howard, for inviting me to, to moderate this awesome panel. Um, as Nick says, we're gonna talk about CASE. Some people call it ACEs. So we're gonna go with the, the CASE acronym, which stands for Connected, Autonomous, Shared, and Electrification. And as Nick introduced, this is a way that many people have been thinking about the changes that have been happening over the last few years in the automotive industry. And each of those four areas have uh, moved at different pace and also been affected by the pandemic in different ways. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then we'll also talk about if we believe that case is still the right paradigm to think about the automotive industry, or do we feel like other letters need to be added to this acronym? So to get started, I'm gonna invite each of our panelists to do a brief introduction of themselves. Sam, do you wanna kick us off? Sure thing. I am Sam. I'm a principal at BMW iVentures. Um, I've been here for roughly four and a half years. I started off at Bosch Ventures, moved on to SK Delegon Ventures. I'm a, also a licensed California attorney. Thanks, Sam. Quinn. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Quinn Garcia. I'm one of the managing directors at Autotech Ventures. Uh, we're a VC firm that invests in auto and mobility and transportation. We've got about 300 million bucks under, uh, under management across a couple funds and in, invested in something 30 something companies, um, all, in, all in ground transportation. And CASE is a, a key part of our, uh, our scope. And then we also add a D on the end, we call it CASED. Uh, so digitization, uh, which includes e-commerce and uh, things like Industry 4.0. Great. Thanks, Gwen. And Dragos. Uh, hi, I'm Dragos Machuk. I'm the Technical Director for Ford's Research and Innovation Center in Palo Alto. Uh, I've been with Ford about six years. Um, before that, I was with Apple, Lockheed, KLA, BMW and car companies were just starting to come to the valley when it was kind of unusual. And coincidentally enough, or strangely enough, I did a PhD in autonomous vehicles at a time when there was no way I was going to do a startup in the field. Thanks, Dragos. And for those who don't know me, I'm Jennifer Roon. I'm currently in executive in residence at Greylock, which is a venture capital firm that invests across a wide variety of industries, so not just in the automotive space. Uh, but Greylock is an investor in a couple of companies in the uh, auto space, including Convoy, Nauto, uh, Aurora, and Neuro. And prior to this, I was at Nauto, one of Greylock's portfolio companies, as the COO and CFO. And before that, I worked on self-driving cars at Google, a company now called Waymo. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. So why don't we talk about each of the parts of CASE individually? And we'll just do it in order. And so if we start with connected, now there was a, connected can mean a couple of different things to people. When I think of connected, I think of, um, you know, the promise of 5G, of V2V technology as a way to improve driving and maybe even to lead to autonomous driving, but there's also connected as a way to just improve the entire in-car experience. So maybe if we, um, Dragos, if you want to talk a little bit about how you view Connected and how you think it's progressed since the introduction of this CASE acronym. Yeah, so 5G still holds that the promise of the V2X, so the vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure. And I, I think to, to, to a large extent, um, my thesis from 20 years ago now is starting to become relevant again, because at the time, we were dependent on the infrastructure. Uh, we were depending, dependent on the communication from vehicle to vehicle because there was no other way to do it. So, you know, along the way came, you know, Google, Waymo, you guys, and show that there is a way to do it autonomously in case you don't have, you know, you don't, this way you don't have to wait for cities to put infrastructure in, you don't have to wait for counties and states. And, and frankly, that's why it failed at that time because we couldn't rely on the infrastructure to, to catch up with our idea. Um, the interesting thing is that those concepts are coming back. So in a way, the pendulum swung. It went from being highly, you know, entirely dependent on infrastructure 
to being totally not dependent on infrastructure to somewhere in the middle where you now start to see this paradigm where the cars can be should be intelligent enough to be safe. But once you start relying on the infrastructure, you actually start getting all these benefits. So you know, in terms of, of safety, being able to see around corners, being able to see pedestrians that, you know, see in quotes that you can't see with cameras or, or LIDAR. Um, the, the whole platooning concept of the ability of having cars communicate with each other. And because of that, you're able to drive them really close to each other, which um, improves the throughput through, through highways. Um, it improves the, the fuel efficiency because the aerodynamics are much better when you have this train of vehicles that are linked electronically. Um, counterintuitively, it makes them safer too because what kills you is the speed at impact. So if you drive really close to each other, even if something horrible happens, the, your, your speed at, differential speed and impact is actually very low. Um, the, the ability to, to now download maps and updates. So there is a lot to be had uh, once the infrastructure comes, comes into place. Um, the other thing you start seeing tiny signals, but I think they've been amplifying in the last year or so. Um, you know, for a while I was talking of this vision where um, there may be cities, particularly in Europe, where they may completely ban manually driven cars. And then autonomous vehicles are a lot easier to implement because you don't have to worry about the rest of the, the drivers because you'll only have mass transit and bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, and for a while, I felt like, you know, I was kind of alone in this and I'm seeing more and more people go into that direction where, where you can see that this is, might be happening sooner than, than later. And in that case, the infrastructure needs to, 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 to be put in place to, to coordinate all these autonomous vehicles um, that go in the city without the rest of the cars around. Um, and then, as you said, the, the other side is now that you are in an autonomous vehicle, so you're not a driver anymore. How do we make you productive? How do you make you entertained? So now you have the data transfer that comes into the vehicle so that you have internet connectivity and, and infotainment and all that stuff. So I think I'll, I'm going to leave it at that. It's, it's still- Thanks, Dragos. Uh, and, and as Dragos right, knows- still trying to explain it. <laughs> yeah, under, yeah, understood. And, and, and as Dragos alluded to and knows, you know, I have been one of the, the folks that are, are a little bit more skeptical of, of connected on the Vita X side of things because of the infrastructure that, that needs to be built. Um, but you also started talking about the other ways that uh, connected can be interpreted. And Quinn, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that because I think Autotech Ventures has made some investments in that space where connected doesn't just mean uh, driving the vehicle. Sure, happy to. Um... So definition of connectivity, uh, the way, way I think about it as I think of it as, as communication between vehicles, occupants and roadside infrastructure. Um, and, and I would define telematics uh, as a form of connectivity um, that allows for transmission of data between a vehicle and the cloud. Say gathering the vehicle's CAN bus data or OBD data and sending it up to the cloud you know, through a SIM card or, or other kind of wireless connectivity uh, protocol. Um, the, so the other way to allow occupants and vehicles and roadside infrastructure to communicate with each other and with cloud is through a smartphone. And I would say that the most prominent connectivity solutions are those enabled by a smartphone um, without a need for, for telematics. Um, Examples of companies that we've invested in um, that are kind of a connectivity solution enabled through a smartphone would be Lyft, um, no telematics uh, required there. Um, Spot Hero, uh, which allows you to, to view and, put and, and book uh, real-time uh, parking garage spot inventory through your smartphone. Um, Blue Dot is a company we invested in, which enables um, payments for toll roads uh, using you know, GPS tracking of your, your smartphone. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of as many B2C killer apps for passenger car telematics um, that have achieved, let's say, mass, mass adoption beyond perhaps some of the, the aftermarket OBD dongle enabled startups like, you know, Automatic, which was acquired by, by Sirius uh, some years ago, and Metromile, which re recently, I guess they're now, now a public uh, company for, for usage-based uh, insurance. 
we, we do have a portfolio company called Indie Semiconductor that produces silicon chips that are used inside those uh, those OBD dongles, but they're not actually offering you know connectivity themselves. They're more of a more of a vendor. Um, I, I would say that um, that you know there are some B two C businesses um, that have been enabled by telematics, like for example, micro mobility fleets, right? The scooter sharing and bike sharing, all those vehicles are have have telematics. You can track where they're where they're parked or you know, peer-to-peer motorhome rentals. Um, so we have, we have a, a company called Outdoorsy, which is like Airbnb for motorhomes. And they, they track the location of the rented motorhomes um, using telematics. Um, but I, I would say that the majority of the successful telematics enabled businesses that, that we've come across are B2B businesses. So fleet telematics. Um, so trucking and delivery vans and work trucks and the like. So like we, we invested in uh, HDVI, um, high definition vehicle insurance, which is a, a telematics enabled long haul truck insurance uh, carrier or, you know, truck labs, which is a telematics enabled truck driver, you know, hyper miling training solution, driver training solution. Uh, and, and Hayden, which was uh, speaking here uh, today at this this event, which is you know doing fleet telematics for for government fleets. So it sounds like connected is still um, part of the paradigm and, and way we would describe what's happening in the automotive industry. There's a lot happening in that in that space, both still with the promise of five G and and that um, opportunity, but also as we talk about you know cars being um, a mode of connection both um, to other businesses and maybe to consumers. Um, why don't we move on to the A of case and talk about autonomous, which sometimes gets more of the, the press <laughs> out of some of the acronyms in case. Um, you know, it's gone through a lot of hype, certainly during the time that, that I've been involved in the AV field. Uh, where do you feel like, Sam, we are on this uh, hype cycle when it comes to autonomous vehicles? Uh, a lot of people felt like we have maybe been through that trough of disillusionment sort of in the 2019 time period, and now we're seeing some real progress. But how do you feel about it? How would you describe it? Yeah, in terms of where we are in the Gartner hype cycle, I would say we're, we're still in the trough of disillusionment, um, but we're kind of progressing towards a, 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 a closer vision where autonomous vehicles could be a, a new reality. That said, I mean, we have to remember that there's different levels of autonomous vehicle technology all the way from, you know, level one, where it's like semi-automated or semi-assisted to level five, where the car basically can run without any sort of human interference. Are, where are we in the hype cycle for level five? I would say certainly we're still in the trough of disillusionment. I, we have yet to see anyone come close to that in, in a safe way. We have yet to see anyone be able to drive a car without any human intervention at any time. Um, we're, we're, we're still very far from that. And then I think, you know, just some market indicators that make me kind of I guess um, more more hesitant than exuberant about the market is just the fact that we've seen Uber, we've seen Apple try to do their autonomous driving um, business units. They've shut down. Some are trying to start it up again. What we've realized in the past few years is that it's actually a very very hard problem to solve. It's just not, it's not just throwing a bunch of engineers at a technical problem. It's it's something that's not just technical that you have to solve. It's also, you have to solve the infrastructure problem of installing the sensors, installing, um, you know, towers to enable, you know, better geolocation so that you know where the car is. Also just fixing the infrastructure for the, you know, the United States, which is kind of, you know, it's been crumbling for the last few years um, and, and continuing to crumble. Um, so we're, very, very far from reaching a level of maturity where we would meet level five. And some actually argue that we will never meet level five. I think I'm optimistic in, in, in viewing that, you know, with enough technology and with enough development, we'll get there one day. But I, you know, I, I don't know when it will be. Um, even Elon Musk, right? He said that we'll have full self-automated driving by 
it was 2020, right? And that that is far from the case. And if we think about trough of disillusionment, we could think about it both in terms of the, the technology and then also in terms of the venture investing. So the technology is still at the, the point of trough of disillusionment. The venture investing is still hot right now. And I think a lot of the, the, the early investors in autonomous driving, they're hitting their exits via the stock market right now. And so there's been a kind of a revival of interest in venture investing in the space. That said, you probably should have picked your winners for the autonomous vehicle market about three or four years ago because sales cycles and development times into automotives are very freaking long, five to six years at least. And so if you haven't put your investments in, you know, quite a few years ago, then then uh, I, I would not be, be you know, exuberant in, in, in putting more money in that market. Thanks, Sam. And it's it's a great point about, you know, the time that most most of us, I think, would agree it would take for us to get to what, what would be, you know, ubiquitous level five self-driving. Um, and, and certainly around the time I left Waymo, there seemed to be this proliferation of startups uh, working on autonomous vehicle technology. And I always felt like that we would see quite a bit of consolidation in the market, not just within the startups, but also with traditional automakers because of the timelines, the money it would take to develop this technology and the talent. It's, it's not, you know, the, some of the talent needed is still pretty unique talent. So maybe Dragos, do you feel like there's gonna be more consolidation in terms of autonomous vehicle technology? Um, you know, Samantha, Sam mentioned that uh, you probably needed to have placed your bets, and I, I know Ford has, has placed a few um, a while ago, um, or, or do you think there's going to be more startups in the AV space and that there's room for them, or, or do you think there's, you know, both? What, what are your thoughts on the, that consolidation part? Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're definitely going through a moment of, of transition, so I think you're going to see both. Um, you know, so in terms of just to pick up from the previous discussion, in terms of level five, I'm definitely in the camp that says it will never happen just because I don't think even the business model will, will add up. Uh, you're going to have some sort of, sort of multimodal transportation that will get you there. Plus that maybe I'm a bit more jaded because I, again, I did my thesis 20 years ago and it was always supposed to be 20 years out. And then Google said it's going to be 10 years out, but on a, on a rolling basis. And now we're on a five years out on a rolling basis. So I think it will still be some some many years out, if ever. Um, yeah, in terms of bets and uh, consolidation, yes, we obviously we uh, betted on on Argo and it's still progressing well. And Volkswagen invested in that too. So you see a bit of this partnership with uh, with friends and competitors. Um, I was bought back by by Neuro, and you have Zooks bought by Amazon and Voyage by Cruise. So definitely a high level of, um, of consolidation. On the other hand, speaking of talent, what, what I find interesting is how we, from, from this industry with OEMs, we started with robot taxis um, and we built that, that knowledge. And then now you see the talent flowing into different areas, which I do think have quite a bit of potential also. So you see trucking. Again, trucking makes a lot of sense because you can run city edge to city edge. Um, and the way I split the space in my head is in this two by two quadrant of speed on, and complexity. So robot taxis are high speed, high complexity. It's probably the hardest technical problem. You have tracking that's high speed, but low complexity because you don't have to need only intersections and bicyclists and children and all that. Plus truck drivers are expensive, hard to find. There is a business model there. Plus when you put a, a LIDAR on a truck, a, it doesn't matter if it's ugly, and B, it, it looks smaller on a truck than it looks on a, on a sedan. Um, so the, the design part also matters. Um, on, the, on the low chaos, um, sorry, on the, on the high chaos, low speed, um, you have urban shuttles, you have deliveries. Um, you know, if you do 20, 30 miles an hour, it's relatively easy to, to come to a stop without killing someone. Um, but the really interesting one, it's in the... In, the lower corner in both, and that's um, low speed, low chaos. When you think about construction, mining, agriculture, we're starting to see a lot of work going into that space where 
you don't have public. Uh, if, if something goes wrong, you may run over some, some lettuce, but it's not going to kill someone. And, and the promise is big too. The, the, the promise of not putting in, you know, 90% of the chemicals that we put in soil right now. The promise of taking dangerous jobs away from humans. And I think all this combination is, is going to bring a, you know, when we talk about autonomy, it's not gonna be just the five levels of the autonomy. It's gonna be a whole spectrum in terms of applications, in terms of uh, geography, in terms of, so it, it's going to be a, a, a churning decade, I think, where you're gonna see both aggregation, you're gonna see a lot of failures and a lot of, uh, of amazing uh, successes. So it sounds like with Sam and Dragos, um, it, we're still in the early stages of autonomy. And I think Quinn would probably agree with that. I know, I think all four of us could probably talk about any of these four topics for ages. <laughs> but since we, we've been tasked with talking about all four parts of case plus what might be missing, I am gonna move us on and then maybe we'll have time to circle back. We are getting some questions. But if we move on to shared, when we think about shared, you know, that's clearly one that has been very obviously impacted by the pandemic. And maybe as we talk about this paradigm, is shared over or do we think it's gonna come back? And if it comes back, will it look different? Um, maybe Quinn, you could start us off talking about that. Sure. Uh, so so yeah, what are, what are the different types of shared mobility solutions that are out there. Uh, and I can share some examples, you know, our experience from, from our portfolio companies. So ride sharing, obviously. Um, so Lyft was crushed by COVID, uh, but their ride volume and their share price is coming back strong now. Uh, and, I, and I think that ride sharing is going to be um, uh, going to be an important solution for a long time to come. Uh, another type of shared mobility would be car sharing. So you have, you know, hourly car sharing like Zipcar or daily or kind of weekly car sharing like a, like a Turo. Um, we haven't invested into any of those companies, so I can't speak to how they performed during COVID, um, but I can share a hypothesis that they're going to recover nicely um, as, as COVID subsides. Um, I actually, I, I could imagine that in some cases, some of those, some of those hourly or even daily car sharing startups uh, achieved a, a bit of a boost in some markets during, during COVID. Um, another form of sharing would be, you know, charter buses. So we, we invested into a company called bus.com, um, chart online charter bus rental marketplace. You can imagine crushed during COVID, right? Nobody's, you know, hopping into a charter bus with 40 of their closest friends. Um, but um, we think that, that the charter bus rental space is going to uh, resume its, its prior volumes uh, eventually as, as COVID subsides. Another application would be, let's say, motorhome sharing. Um, so we, as, as I mentioned earlier, we, we invested into Outdoorsy. Uh, it's like the Airbnb for motorhomes. And demand for, for shared motorhomes uh, was explosive before COVID. Um, it became cool, uh, Instagram worthy even before COVID, uh, but then COVID added fuel to the fire because nobody's nobody's flying to Bali on vacation anymore. Uh, and I think that the demand is going to remain strong even even after COVID. Um, and yet another form would be car subscription services, uh, which are essentially like I think of them either as long term car rentals, uh, used car rentals, or short term used car leases. However, you want to. You want to think about it. Um, I, I can say from our experience, at least in the UK, we invested in a company called Drover, um, which is a car subscription service startup uh, based in the UK, and they their demand exploded during COVID um, because a lot of folks who were prior uh, previously relying on public transit to get to work uh, wanted to flee to the safety of a private car, but didn't want to necessarily uh, buy one. Um, so those are some some examples from from our experience. Thanks, Quinn. So it sounds like you feel like shared definitely will come back in all its forms and will continue to grow and be an important paradigm in automotive. Sam or Dragos, any disagreement there? Or, or you feel the same way? I have, I guess I would say a little bit more reservation. Um, but but I, I, I generally agree that people will go back to shared mobility just because, I mean, we, we've all had it where we've been in a social situation 
um, during the pandemic and it just felt completely natural, like the pandemic never happened. Um, but what has emerged because of the pandemic is what I would call the, the hierarchy of mobility where um, we have on the top of this hierarchy kind of a privileging of um, private ownership because people don't want to share as much car purchases and uh, especially of um, rent uh, of used cars skyrocketed during the pandemic as a result of that because people were turning away specifically from uh, buses from public transportation from their lifts and their ubers and so they had to buy the the used car they didn't buy the new cars but they they they, they went to a private ownership model those guys are not going to come back most likely they they might have they might continue to to do shared mobility in some instances when you know when they don't want to use their private car but generally speaking those guys will likely not come back and then we also have you know that trend coupled with just the the urban exodus people have left the, the urban areas to the suburbs. We all know that the urban centers are where, you know, sh at least for like shared mobility for things like Uber and Lyft, that's where those guys have, you know, the, the, the most activity. Um, so I generally agree, but they're just, a, I would say there's a little bit um, of, of certain nuances around the future because of um, people buying cars and just general fear um, and, and sometimes you just cannot change fear. Yeah, I'm, I'm, Thanks, I think Sam. I'm going to disagree and a little bit with Sam. Like, I, I think the car, the, you have the private ownership is going to go up, you know, obviously went up during the COVID. I think it might go up another year. Once people start experiencing nasty traffic again, uh, I think we're going to go back to, to lifts and Ubers once we are all vaccinated. And that Fleeing from urban areas, I, I personally think it's temporary. It, it was in, enabled by the ability to work from home, but I think we're still social animals and eventually we still want to, to get back together. And um, you, you, you can't be in the office from Montana. Um, so I think we're gonna come back to the cities. I think we're going to come back with nasty traffic and that was gonna push us back to, to Lyfts and Ubers or whatever other form. But, you know, it's, it's an opinion, obviously. <laughs> well, this was a great one. I wish we had a whole, uh, the whole session to talk about this because this one's juicy where there, there's less agreement and, and <laughs> a, a great example of how automotive and transportation touches so many other things. I think Dragos and, and Sam, you both mentioned, you know, we still don't know exactly when things will get back to, you know, pre-pandemic normal or if they will get back to pre-pandemic normal and, you know, urbanization or are we going to go back to the growth of suburbs all sorts of interesting things to talk about there but i do want to move on to electrification because that has been a hot 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 area right and i know that there was a session earlier specifically on SPACs and we've seen a lot of SPAC activity particularly in electrification um maybe is maybe to start with do we feel like this SPAC activity for evs is is that good for the future of EVs? Um, I know that's a big question, <laughs> uh, but I would love to hear an opinion. Maybe Dragos, you, you, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, and I, I think it's a combination of things that's going to make this really a, an inflection point for EVs. So you have obviously consumer demand um, that, that that's pushing us in, in that direction. You have the, the price parity between EV powertrain and ICE powertrain that's coming. It, it's probably one of the few trends I've seen, like I was talking about AVs where the goalpost constantly moves out with, with a price parity with, between EV powertrains and, and ICE powertrains is the only trend I've seen that moves the other way. Like every year we predict a, you know, a year when it's gonna become the parity, the next year it shrinks. And now it really seems like 2030, it's, it's going to be that point of, of parity. Um, there is all that interest is bringing a lot more money in, in batteries, which have lagged the development of other uh, necessary technologies. I think that is going to attract talent, which in turn is going to, to speed up the development of, of batteries that are going to be, again, considerably cheaper and pack more energy. Um, you have the regulation from, from various governments and Yes, maybe to, to some extent that they're, they're being um, overly optimistic, but they're pushing in that direction, right? California has done this over and over and over again 
with regulations that seemed insane at the point when we, we set them, and yet we managed to achieve them, and, and we're, we're driving that. Um, the SPACs, I think it's, it's just another um, element in, in, the, in this whole spectrum that is driving that, that adoption. Um, you know, from, from a anecdotal but very personal point of view, um, you know, the, the introduction of our Maki and what excites me the most about it is the kind of people that are drawing over it. You know, I've, I've had people in, in Porsches roll down their window. I've, said, I've had people in Tesla take pictures of it. They haven't done that with any of other Ford vehicles I've driven for the last six years. This, so, you know, clearly the demand uh, is, is absolutely there and people are, up, you know, the, the, the consumers are absolutely excited about this, this space. Now, I have to say, living here in, in Silicon Valley, um, I, I've always felt my view of EVs is a little distorted, right? Because it's the home of Tesla and, and in parts of Silicon Valley, you, you can see Teslas everywhere. Um, but we know from, from sales data, auto, automotive sales data, that EVs are still actually a tiny, tiny portion of overall vehicle sales. So um, maybe I'll start with Quinn to get the, the non-OEM perspective, but I'm gonna ask you as well, Sam. Do you want to make a prediction, or, or I'm going to ask you to make a prediction? When will we see much larger consumer adoption of EVs? You know, I made predictions on AVs, and they and they were wrong. So I'm now I'm going to ask you to make a bit of a prediction. When do we think we'll see that that turnover to really what we would consider mass adoption of EVs by consumers? So, is it this one for Quinn? Well, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, Sam, please go ahead. I will, I will interject with an OEM perspective and then Quinn can give his non-OEM perspective. Great. Um, so a lot of it will be set by these OEMs who have put in targets, um, whether it's 2030, 2040, to just stop making um, combustion engine vehicles. Um, the whole industry is starting to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think once you have no alternative to purchase a combustion engine vehicle, then you will necessarily go electric. Um, and then it's, I would also say that um, electrification EVs, it's kind of becoming a, a trendy thing, right? We have the, the woke generation, you know, you know, millennials and Gen Zers, they all, they all want to save the world and then go green. And that's kind of propelling the shift to going more electric. But I would say maybe comfortably 2030, uh, we'll start seeing quite a bit more. Quinn? Yeah, so I was, in the past, I would call myself uh, an electrification zealot. Um, I, I started getting into hybrids and EVs in 2003. And, and I, you know, back then, I think I had an unrealistic view of of uh, how quickly they would penetrate the market. And, and I spent five years of my life on Better Place doing uh, electric car uh, recharging infrastructure. And we spent a billion dollars and company went to a better place. And, um, and so now I've, I've started to take a little bit more of a, a realistic view, um, or at least what I think is realistic view. And, I, and when I think about the drivers of consumer adoption of EVs, what are the things that come to mind? So aesthetics, um, some of the EVs produced some years ago were by the incumbent automakers were ugly and consumers didn't want them. Um, and Tesla was one of the only decent looking EVs um, back then. But now a bunch of automakers, you know, Dragos was, was just talking about their, their vehicles, right? they're producing beautiful EVs. So, so maybe aesthetics aren't going to be as much of a throttle on consumer adoption going forward. Another throttle would be form factor, um, not aesthetics, but let's call it utility in the shape of the vehicle. And we, we Americans uh, love our SUVs and our pickup trucks and Chinese love their SUVs as well. Um, and aside from the RAV4 EV that was produced, I don't know, a decade plus ago, um, and the Ford Ranger EV, maybe two decades ago, um, there weren't too many SUVs and, uh, and EV um, uh, pickup trucks uh, sold in, in volume. Just in the past few years, uh, incumbent automakers uh, and new entrant EV OEMs, you know, Rivian and Tesla and these, these guys 
are finally starting to produce uh, some great SUV and, and pickup trucks. And, and I think pickup buyers um, are increasingly interested in a badass EV pickup truck with more low end torque than a combustion pickup. Another factor would be cost. Um, and, and the cost, you know, mainly driven by, by the battery, but also other, other parts of the powertrain, uh, motors, inverters, and whatnot. And the cost is continuously dropping, which is great for consumer adoption. Uh, government policies play a big role in, in cost of, of EVs. And it happens that um, the governments of the nations that have the largest car park in the world and the largest, the greatest vehicle miles traveled in the world are supportive of EVs. China, North America, Europe, even India in recent times has become supportive of EVs from, from a policy perspective. Um, I would say Latin America and African governments have not prioritized EVs. Uh, and, I, and I think that the cost of EVs will remain prohibitively high for those, for those regions for, for years to come. Um, range is another factor, again, you know, highly uh, correlated to, uh, to cost, positively correlated due to the battery. Range is continuously getting better, um, but there's kind of an asymptote in terms of, you know, consumer demand for, for incremental range, meaning there's diminishing consumer demand for range if you go beyond, say, 300, 400 miles, and we're, it looks like we're getting there, so maybe check on that. And then the last one would be recharging infrastructure. Um, going back to kind of better place, um, I think it becomes less important. Um, public recharging infrastructure becomes less important in the future for opportunity charging as vehicles range increases uh, because you can just charge at home and charge it or charge at work. We invested in Volta Charging, which is an ad funded um, public EV charging network, and they, they give away charging for, for free. And the bet is that, you know, consumers are, are probably not going to be willing to pay much for public opportunity charging uh, if, they, if they have enough range and the ability to charge at work or from home. And you know we didn't have a chance, but there's also, of course, in electrification, lots going on outside of the consumer market with um, buses and shuttle buses and even big rigs now. So I think there's still a lot of room to grow on the electrification side. Now, I think technically we may be coming up on our time. Um, like I said, we, we've had a lot to talk about, um, but if I can, I would love just to touch on this idea of what might be missing from CASE since that acronym was created. And I know Quinn, you talked about you and your team have added a D. Do you wanna maybe touch quickly on for you what that D uh, is? Sure, uh, so digitization, uh, which, which is basically we think of it as using IT to streamline business processes. What the heck does that mean? Well, using IT to engage with your, uh, your customers and your suppliers and transact with them, also known as e-commerce, right? That's one form of digitization. Um, another form would be industry 4.0. So using IT to streamline internal processes. Uh, so for example, um, we invest in a company called Cogniac uh, which is uh, automating visual inspection in automotive uh, plants. So point a camera at your assembly line and use a, use a computer to, to visually inspect instead of you know, paying, paying humans, right? And then e-commerce, you know, we've, we've invested in a bunch of kind of um, digital auto retailing um, companies. So a company called Digital Motors, which is basically hel helping uh, auto dealers to, uh, with a SaaS solution to help them uh, sell cars online, new cars. And Sam and Dragos, anything that you would add to the case uh, paradigm? What's the new business models? Like the, the biggest challenge we've had in this industry is to shift to software from mechanical engineering to software. And that was an engineering problem. Now we need to change our, our business models because you make money differently with data and services than you make with things, with widgets. You make money differently with bits than you make with atoms. And I think that's going to be the, the, the next challenge we have is figuring out what are those business models in, in how, how you, you make money with, with services up to and including you know, selling the vehicle for, for sub cost and, and making money on, on the back end on services. We're not, we're not quite there yet, but that, that's an interesting paradigm shift. Definitely interesting. Sam, anything you would add? 
Quinn has cased. Uh, I, I would be an advocate for cases. And my second S would be for sustainability. And the reason why is because for four and a half years, I've been at BMW iVentures. We had our investment mandate. We covered, you know, eight areas. Only recently, about a year and a half ago, did we add sustainability as one of our investment areas to focus on. And the reason why is because, and I'm sure all of you know it, uh, automotives pay a ton of money um, for carbon offsets. Um, and then there's also a whole bunch of new um, ESG environmental sustainability regulations that are being passed to put an emphasis to 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 basically force corporations uh, that you know are, might produce a lot of um, um, I guess you know carbon in the air through their manufacturing processes to put a, a emphasis on um, sustainability and um, you know having a more circular supply chain where you don't really you don't hope for the hope is to not eat up the the world's resources at the end of the day. So we had in the last year and a half actually did two investments or three investments, excuse me, in in this area. One was Prometheus Fuels, which is um, an alternative gas um, gasoline that would be um, produced through carbon um, taken from the air. One was um, Pure Cycle, an alternative um, uh, recycled plastic that may result all the properties of virgin resin. And then the last one was um, Boston Metal, which is clean metal, clean, clean metals, which so I'm a big proponent of sustainability, not just as because it's necessary for, you know, automotives to meet certain governmental regulations, but I also firmly believe it's a moral imperative for the industry as well. Really interesting. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it sounds like within case alone, there's so much going on and still a ways to go um, for, for all of these areas. But um, with digitization, new business models, certainly sustainability, uh, it makes automotive a, a particularly exciting space to be in these days. Um, as we come up in time, I don't know, Howard, if we have, if we have time, I would if we do, then I might pick from some of the questions from the audience. Yeah, please do. We, I think we have a few more minutes. So why don't you okay. pick this case? Great. Well, since I know sharing was such a, a hot topic and a, and a little bit of a, the more controversial one within us, I'm going to ask this question um, from Mike. He was curious. Um, part of car sharing is, is uh, you know, technology enabling uh, car rental, as he, as he describes it. And if we think about car sharing, um, it really has been led by, by other companies, not traditional car rental companies like the Avis and Hertz. Um, and so, you know, where do we feel like this leaves traditional car rental companies? Is it something that once you have the technology, you can adopt it and change your business model? Or is there something fundamentally, something else going on? Um, that will make it harder for these traditional car rental companies to, to catch up. I'm gonna leave it open. Who wants to address that one? Or I can pick on folks. I'm happy to when? chime in. <laughs> uh, so my, my take on, on you know, the car rental industry is their, so their business traveler segment was getting crushed even before COVID. Uh, rideshare, penetration of rideshare in urban centers where business travels were, were visiting um, was eating away um, at, the, at the kind of a business rental business. And, and that caused a number of the uh, major car rental companies to incur financial distress, let's say. Um, uh, some of them, you know, <clears throat> enterprise, the strongest probably in the world, has not been as in as much distress. They're in a much you know, stronger position than than some of the others. Uh, during COVID, um, obviously business travel disappeared um, and leisure travel did uh, as well. I, I think there still were some. There still was some some car rental business during uh, during COVID for for leisure for road trips and the like, but uh, got crushed. And you know we have we have a company portfolio company Fixico in Europe that's. Helping car rental companies to fix dents on the cars they rent, and, and the car rentals business uh, companies' business just went down the tubes. Um, but I think that that is going to resume the leisure kind of car rental 
um, uh, application will resume uh, post post COVID. Um, I think in the truck space. So one of our LPs, you know, publicly known as Ryder, um, not doing passenger cars, but doing you know pickups and box trucks and vans and you know class eight trucks and the like and. Um, and that I think that segment will uh, will be healthy post COVID. People are still going to need box trucks to move things around, and um, uh, so I, I would expect for that to um, to continue to thrive. Maybe I'll I'll throw in one more because I was thinking of this as well, uh, Sam, as you were talking about sustainability. Um, Ilya asked, uh, "What's your outlook on the deployment of hydrogen infrastructure, particularly in cities?" And I know that's one of the alternate alternative fuels. Um, in the automotive industry. Sam, do you have a thought on that? Oh gosh, we're far away from that. Um, uh, it's anytime you rely on public government to do anything, I have a heavy dose of skepticism. Um, let, let's hope that the automotive industry can, can move first and then um, lead, lead the public gov you know, governmental officials to do stuff. But whenever something requires bureaucracy i'm like i am out um <laughs> so that's that's my that's my general take on it great thank you so i i think we're pretty much out of time jennifer uh and team uh but thank you so much for a terrific discussion you guys um nailed it and jennifer you were a terrific moderator so thank you for doing all that i think you i mean obviously we couldn't cover everything in, in 40 minutes, uh, but we covered a lot. So thank you for doing that.